so welcome to the seminar today. And uh, our speaker today is Aran Palti, from, who is now in Ben Gurion. So we had an overlap in Ecole Polytechnic. And uh, at that time, he was working on, on, on Decitus places. And, and, he has, and he has continued to work on, uh, uh, on these kind of issues, which is now known as Swampland. And today, he will take a, tell us about one of the important Swampland conjectures, which is the weak gravity conjectures. And, and, and efforts towards proving it. Uh, so over to Iran. Okay, thank you. And uh, thank you for the invitation to speak. So the title of my talk is Convexity of Charged Operators in CFTs and the Weak Gravity Conjecture. And um, this is a work that came out um, a few months, a couple of months ago with uh, Ofer Ahawani. Um, so let me begin. Um, so st string theory provides uh, a large number of different low energy effective theories, which have an ultraviolet completion to quantum gravity. And in general, the different theories have different properties, like different number of particles, different gauge groups, and so on. Um, but there are some uh, rare features which, as far as we can tell, seem to be common to all of them. So there seem to be some universal features of all the low energy effective theories that, that can come from string theory. And the uh, Swampland program is motivated by the existence of such apparently universal features with an aim to understand if they are always uh, required by uh, any theory which has a UV completion to quantum gravity. So in other words, the, we see these universal features in string theory and we ask, um, is it true that any effective theory that can be UV completed um, must have these features? And um, uh, we try to understand that and we try to see what those features are. And the, the, the swamp plan is then all, all the effective theories which, which violate these, these, these conditions, which don't have these, these features. So, so those theories are, uh, are conjectured not to be able to complete a ball to quantum gravity and therefore they lie, <clears throat> they lie in the swamp plant. So that's the, the idea. Um, and uh, perhaps one of the most uh, oldest and, and most famous such uh, features or, or properties um, that people have considered is that in quantum gravity there are no um, U1 global symmetries. That's the um, idea. Uh, that's a conjecture, and um, and the, the simplest argument that um, uh, is that if you had a U1 global symmetry, then a black hole in that theory would not reflect uh, any of the global symmetry charge in its horizon. So, in other words, if it if if it uh, if it was charged under the U1 global symmetry, you wouldn't be able to tell um, from outside the black hole. And this is the so-called no hair theorem. And that would be a very strange situation because that means that that black hole could have any global symmetry charge. And therefore there's an infinite number of microstates that, that the black hole could correspond to. So uh, distinguishing microstates by the global symmetry charge, there could be an infinite number of possibilities. And this is in contradiction with the expected finite entropy of black holes, um, which should be proportional to the, to the, should be given by the area. So I like Bekenstein Hawking. So, um, we expect that a black hole with a fixed area has a finite number of microstates. And so um, uh, this would be in contradiction with this idea. So this is, um, uh, I think, the simplest and, and uh, argument for why there can be no U1 global symmetries in quantum gravity. And um, one may ask, uh, OK, so it's true that if, if you saw a black hole, you wouldn't be able to tell what global symmetry charge it has from the outside, and therefore you should, should associate it with any global symmetry charge. But you can also ask, can I really make uh, a black hole with a fixed mass with any global symmetry charge? And the answer is uh, yes, and, and, and in the following sense, um, you can just uh, take a black hole um, um, and throw in n, n particles uh, charged under the, this U1 global symmetry. And um, you can then uh, give it any charge this way, and then you let it, let it hawk and radiate away down to any mass scale you wish. So that means that you can have any charge for any mass black hole. And 
Uh, in particular, you could um, let it radiate away all the way down to the Planck scale, um, by which then you then you you, you lose the, the semi-classical description of it. And what you end up with is some light, so light is in mass around the Planck scale object with some uh, global symmetry charge, and that object is then completely stable. Um, it's called a charge remnant. So it's stable because it has charge and it cannot decay back to the particles that you threw in that gave it its charge because it's lost all its mass along the way through Hawking radiation. So this Hawking radiation made it lose all its mass, but it didn't lose any charge because um, there is no global symmetry charge on the horizon. And so it cannot emit any, any global symmetry charge. So you can then do the same thing with, with one more extra particle. So give it another charge and reduce, send it down and you see, and that way you get a remnant of charge. And that's one, and this way you get an infinite number of different charge remnants, all um, somewhere near the Planck scale and all stable. So this infinite number of stable states that you get is very much the same, uh, uh, very much very similar to the, to the infinite number of microstates that you would have, um, which would violate the bekenstein hawking entropy. So in this sense, the violation of the entropy is tied to this infinite number of stable states. Um, yeah. Are there any questions about this, the kind of arguments against you on global symmetries? Um, uh, sorry, yeah. I couldn't follow why you, uh, why there should infinite number of stable remnants, uh, this last part of the argument. Sorry, why this remnant should be stable? No, no, why there should be infinite number of them. Oh, because you can start with any global symmetry charge and 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 send uh, so you, by the time you reach the Planck scale, you would not you would uh, you would retain the same global symmetry charge you started with, and you can start with an infinite number of possible initial global symmetry charges. Is that? Yeah, but uh, but you're also throwing in mass, right? And uh, yes. but but the mass is lost because uh, the mass Hawking is lost. Okay, I see. So you say that then, uh, okay. Okay, then whatever remains has to carry this charge. And uh, you said and that that would require infinite number of states to carry this uh, possibility, right? That is what you're saying. Well, you would get in this infinite number of stable remnants. And they are related to the infinite number of microstates that a black hole would have if you had a global symmetry, you have global symmetry because. But is there some way to argue without uh, without uh, arguing for remnants, without requiring remnants to exist? Well, it's like there is this argument here that if you so if you take a black hole um, of a fixed mass, you throw in a particle like this, you increase its charge, and then you let the black hole let's say radiate radiate away the mass of the particle. So then you get back the same mass of the black hole, but with one more charge. Um, that means that in that theory, for a black hole of a given mass, you actually have an infinite number of possible charges that it could have, because you could always throw in another particle, emit away the mass of that particle, and then it would, the charge would go up by one again. So mm -hmm. this is in contradiction with the expected finite entropy of black holes, because that means that if you see a black hole with a fixed mass, it could have an infinite number of charges, but you should only have a finite number of microstates. Um, mm. Uh, okay. Okay. From this one to that black hole. Okay. 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 Thanks. And this is closely tied to this remnants because in, instead of just emitting the mass of the particle you threw in, you could emit away the mass of all the particles you threw in, uh, so that you go down to the Planck scale, and then you get this infinite number of stable remnants. Any more questions? Or okay. So now we can kind of rephrase this argument in a different way, which is kind of, it's not really rephrasing a slightly different statement, but uh, it keeps the same spirit and, and, and it will be more easy to work with. So instead of considering an infinite number of uh, stable states coming from a black hole emitting Hawking radiation, we just take a charge particle, a particle charge under the U1 global symmetry in our theory, and we put two, two of the such particles next to each other, so it's in a copy of itself. And then that particle will feel a gravitational attractive force to its copy and um, it will form a bound state and the mass to charge ratio of this bound state um, 
is going to be smaller than the mass to charge ratio of the particle because the, the charge of the bound state will be twice the charge of the particle. But the mass of the bound state will be slightly less than twice the mass of the particle because there is some binding energy. So there's a binding energy from the particle being attracted to each other. And um, that means that this bound state is going to be stable. So it cannot decay back to the particle because it's easy to show that um, an object can only decay to some other object if the object it decays to has a um, smaller mass to charge ratio. And since the bound state has a smaller mass to charge ratio than the particle, it cannot decay back to the particle. And if you have many different particles in your theory, then you just have to pick the one with the smallest mass to charge ratio. And so it cannot decay back to this particle, it cannot decay back to any other particle, because that's by definition the one with the smallest mass to charge ratio. And so it's completely stable bound state. So this way, if you um, had a UN global symmetry and you had a particle in your theory, you would form an infinite number of stable bound states. Um, and this is this, this is a similar kind of thing to the, to the infinite number of um, remnants, stable remnants, and the infinite number of microstates for the black holes. Not exactly the same, but similar in spirit. So, so this is kind of in, we expect that this is an inconsistent situation. Um, so what we want to do is we should then, if you want to have a U1 symmetry, we should gauge that U1 symmetry. So gauge U1 symmetries are, are OK. Uh, we know that they're perfectly fine in quantum gravity. And what happens to this story when you gauge the U1 symmetry? Then if you gauge it, then um, you now when you put this particle next to cover of each other, you not only have gravitational attraction, but you also have gauge repulsion. And um, uh, because the, they are they are they are charged, they're the same charge, the same particle, and and yes, and similarly, um, it's no longer true that if you start with a black hole of any charge, it can uh, emit its mass by Hawking radiation all the way down to the Planck scale because there is this extremality bound now for charged black holes. So uh, uh, the black hole can only emit radiation down to a mass which is bounded by the charge of the black hole in Planck units. Um, if it reaches that bound, then it will stop emitting radiation. So what we see is that um, gauging the U1 kind of puts a bound on, these, uh, uh, on this story. But um, it's clear that if we send a gauge coupling to zero, then we just recover the same thing again. So if we send a gauge coupling to zero, there is no force here. So you just recover the attractive force of gravity, and here there is no bound, becomes becomes trivial. So it's not enough to gauge the U1. Uh, you cannot gauge it arbitrarily weakly. You cannot gauge it and send the gauge coupling to zero. Um, and so you have to gauge it sufficiently strongly to avoid these things. So that's like saying that if you have a gauge U1 and you send a gauge coupling to zero, you turn it into a global U1 because you lose the propagating degree of freedom but you still retain the selection rule, uh, which is an exact selection rule. So that's like a global U1. Um, so you can't just gauge it arbitrarily weakly. You have to gauge it sufficiently strongly. So what does sufficiently strongly mean? Well, there's only one other thing to compare it to here, gravity. So you have to gauge the U1 sufficiently strongly with respect to gravity. So that's the, uh, that's the idea. And what does sufficiently strongly mean? Well, it's quite clear in this sense here, you should gauge it so that this force, this repulsive force should beat the attractive force due to gravity. Um, um, and if that's the case for this particle, then that's also exactly the same condition that this particle allows uh, the charged black holes to emit, to, to emit charge by emitting this particle. Uh, and that way, uh, you don't get these remnants because the black holes can just uh, discharge themselves. They can emit these particles and lose their charge this way. So that is um, the weak gravity conjecture. It proposes that we should gauge U1s sufficiently strongly uh, so that we do not have stable black holes or, as I showed, also stable bound states of this particle. Um, it's motivated by avoiding these, these inconsistencies in the case of U1 global symmetry that I discussed, and we see that kind of directly. Um, but it's not, it's not proven that that must be the case, uh, that you cannot have these, these, these completely stable um, states in your theory. Uh, and so that, in that sense, it's still a conjecture. Um, so the conjecture is, uh, as we said, that there should be a particle 
whose gauge repulsive force beats its gravitational attractive force. So this is where the name comes from. The weak gravity conjecture means that for this particle, gravity, which is the attractive force, is weaker than the gauge force. So gravity is the weakest force acting on this particle. The conjecture is that there should be at least one particle in your theory for which this is true, for which gravity is the weakest force acting on it. It need not be the case for all particles, but for one particle at least, gravity should be the weakest force. So are there any questions for this introduction to the weak gravity conjecture? Uh, what would what will be the case for the uncharged black hole? Sorry? Uh, what will be the case, uh, case for the uncharged black hole, uh, weak gravity conjecture? Well, the uncharged black hole is not stable. It doesn't have any symmetry to to guarantee its stability. So it can just emit in principle, it could just emit uh, all its mass away by Hawking radiation. So it, it's not it's not a problem. Um, the problem is that if you have charge states, that they are stable. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. So if you have some extremal black hole, then. Uh, you would require that it, can, it, 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 it doesn't decay, right? In this, uh, it, it, if, if this is true? No, right, so, well, if this is true, then it will be able to decay. Uh, so this means that there is some particle in your theory which will allow the black hole to decay. To, so it doesn't, so it's not stable. Uh, are extremal black holes, do they saturate this uh, bound? I mean, is that the point? Extremal black holes also saturate this band, but the, yeah. the, the band for black holes is the other is the opposite. So mass is bigger than the charge. Mm -hmm. So a non-extremal black hole will have a mass bigger than charge. And what we require here is that the charge is bigger than the mass for the particle. Oh, it's, it's wrong. Okay. Yeah, so they both saturate it. But um, what the particle will let you do is it will let the black hole discharge itself. Because remember what I said, this is generally true if you have an object that will that can decay, it can only decay to something which has a smaller mass to charge ratio. So for a black hole to decay, you need a particle smaller than its mass to charge ratio. If you take the black hole to be an extreme of black hole, that's mass is equal to, to, to charge. So the mass to charge ratio is one. So that means you need a particle with a mass to charge ratio bigger than or equal to one. And that's what the condition is here. Yeah, but... Uh... But again, I, this is so. Shouldn't extremal black holes be somewhat stable things? Uh, at least, if it has sufficient supersymmetry, I mean, uh, because they have often temperature zero, and you would expect that uh, uh, they are stable. So, if you have n equals two supersymmetry and you take a BPS black hole, then it will be stable. It's actually marginally stable in the sense that. Um, uh, in that, that case is the case when all of this is saturated. So M is exactly equal to this, uh, exactly, because it's a BPS black hole. And the same thing would be true here for this particle. M would be exactly equal to it. And that, that means that you could, in some sense, you know, BPS states, the, they, they don't feel the force, so you can just move this particle away, in a way as, as you wish. Um, but uh, N equals so two there's states. there's a flat are, direction, you mean? There's a flat there can direction. Be, there doesn't have to be. There can be. There doesn't have to be. Um, it could be completely stable. It depends where you're sitting in the moduli space. If you're in a wall of marginal stability, then the, there's a flat direction. If you're away from it, it's completely stable. Um, uh, so n equals two supersymmetry is uh, BPS states and n equals two supersymmetry are very special because they can be exactly stable. So um, that's exactly when this is exactly saturated. So the statement is more to do with uh, if you don't have exact n equals two supersymmetry, you don't have a, if you don't have a BPS state, then which way are things uh, breaking? So uh, no, I'm just my basic question is as follows: for a general extremal black hole, then uh, you shouldn't think of it as a. I mean, the, the, I mean the microscopic description becomes a, a little bit harder to give if you if that is. Uh, if that can decay, right? I mean, if that well, can, you just uh, uh, just by charge and energy conservation, you can ask if it can decay or not. So, and this is required for for it to decay by charge and energy conservation. 
But if this is violated, it cannot decay just by charge and energy conservation. But your basic argument as a whole doesn't consider uh, ex extremal black holes. You're simply are giving the argument away from extremality and you're coming to this conclusion based on uh, that you cannot yeah, have, you can have a, monsters, so. Well, no, you can have extremal black holes and you can ask for them to be able to decay. Uh, and they, they can do that. They can emit uh, particles if, if so there's a difference between an extremal black hole and, and, and a PPS state with supersymmetry. So if you take an extremal black hole, it can still emit a particle and, and decay. Um, yeah. Okay, you no, know, I just, uh, but, uh, but how does this consistent with the fact that it has zero Hawking radiation, that is zero Hawking temperature because uh, so, I mean, just to, uh, yeah, so, yeah, maybe, uh, so the, 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 you're asking about the mechanism, how does it emit it? What is the mechanism for discharging itself, I guess? So, so yeah, the, I mean, the, if, if it is sufficiently large uh, macro state uh, with a lot of micro states, it should, it should behave sort of like a pole, right? And, and if it can decay, it should, but maybe what you're trying to say is that the decay mechanisms are highly constrained. so. It is not like a thermal, uh, not like a usual kind of decay, like a Hawking evaporation process. There's, there's two types of decay channels. You can do what's called the Schwinger pair, Schwinger pair production in the electric field of the black hole. So you just, you just pair produce a particle, okay, right. and, a particle and they fall in. And there's, a, there's also a thermal decay channel, but if it's extreme, well, there's no thermal decay channel, but yeah. I see it. Okay. Okay. So this is a Schwinger product production mechanism that can, that can that's allow one of the, there's two mechanisms okay. that can happen. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. But if there's no such particle, there's no possible decay just by charge and energy conservation. So you have a completely stable state. So that's what we try to avoid. So, okay. So now we can start to play a bit with this logic and look at different situations. So for example, you can ask, Okay, so when you just had the gravity and gauge field, you wanted this particle to be repulsive, so it doesn't form a bound state. Um, now what happens if there's more forces acting on it? Well, the only force that can act between the particle and the copy of itself is a scalar force, a scalar mediated force. And scalar forces always act attractively. And so we can ask what happens when the scalar fields in the game and when they are massless scalar fields so that they can act as long range forces so this is a Coulomb long range force. This is a Coulomb long range force. You need some Coulomb long range form from scalars here. So if there's massless scalar fields, then the proposal is that the weak gravity condition should be modified so that the particles should be self repulsive. So that means that we should now rewrite it like this, where now the attractiveness of gravity is modified by also the attractiveness due to the scalar, to the coupling to scalar fields. Um, so that's an example of how the weak gravity trajectory can be modified in different situations um, by keeping the same logic. And, but in different settings, different theories. So here's another example, which is the one that's relevant. Um, well, okay, so this, this, this so I should say these arguments, you know, you might, they're a little bit hand wavy, but they're kind of um, leading, I think, the way um, towards like uh, justifying, uh, to trying to think what kind of ways to test this in string theory. And then, so after this was proposed, you can go and test it in string theory. And indeed, this is, this is done. So here's an example of, of tests in string theory where these conjectures seem to be satisfied. So here's a, here's a plot of, of the spectrum of states in some, and then this is an F theory construction. And, and this is the charge of the states. And this is their mass. So all these dots have a mass bigger than charge. That means they're self-repulsive. Um, but there's also massless scalar fields in the game. That's this, this line here. And if you add the two attractive forces, gravity and the scalars, you get the blue line and you see the red dots are self-repulsive particles. So that means the repulsive force beats the two attractive forces. So indeed they satisfy the, the conjecture. And this is fairly typical of string theory and there are no violations found to date of this um, so far. Um, though it's difficult to test it in non-supersymmetric settings just because it's difficult to construct non-supersymmetric backgrounds of string theory. So there are no, so string theory seems to support, as far as we can tell, these ideas. Um, but again, there's no proof. So now what we want to do is we want to do something similar. Um, instead of adding scalar fields, we want to look at a slightly different situation and take the same logic and see what it would mean there. So now what we want to do is think about what happens in anti-de-sitter space. 
So um, what do we do in anti sitter space? Well, in, in flat space, um, we had the conjecture was a statement about the long range of repulsive forces because you could take the particle and this partner infinite distance away from each other. And then the only forces that act on them are the long range Coulomb forces. Everything else just drops off. Um, but in ADS space, you can't do that anymore because ADS essentially acts like a box. So you can't uh, separate a, a particle from its copy by an infinite um, distance. Um, and so uh, one may ask then, what is the natural statement to, to, a, to ask for in ADS space? Uh, one should not, it should not be some statement about the long range forces anymore. Um, and so we see that from the logic, um, what we really want to say is that you shouldn't form bound states from these particles because these are these stable bound states. So not forming bound states is a statement that is saying that this uh, particle and its copy have a positive binding energy, essentially, instead of a negative binding energy, a positive one. So that means they um, they don't have a binding energy or negative binding energy. And this is what we call the so we propose that this should be true, and we, we call this the binding positive binding conjecture. So for any weakly coupled gravitational theory with a U1 gauge field, there should exist at least one charged particle in the theory with a charge of order one, which is um, um, uh, something that seems to be true in string theory, but we, we will impose it, uh, which has a non-negative self-binding energy. And that will ensure that you don't form these bound states. So in flat space, this statement is exactly the same as uh, the particle being self-repulsive under long-range forces. Um, not exactly, but it's, it's pretty much the same statement. But in ADS space, it's not the same because um, the, to the binding energy, everything contribute, many things contribute, not just the long-range forces. So here, here, let me give an example in, in, in five-dimensional anti sitter space, which shows the difference between this and the other formulation of the weak gravity conjecture. So we can consider this theory in, in five-dimensional ADS space. It has a charge scalar field. Um, where this is its mass. And normally the weak gravity conjecture will be some statement about its charge and its mass. But we are proposing that instead one should, should demand uh, positive binding energy. And actually to the binding energy, also these two terms contribute. Um, this phi to the four and phi squared, the new phi. They have coefficients in front of them, A and B. And you can calculate the binding energy of this particle in ADS space. This was done already. And the binding energy receives contribution from photon exchange and from graviton exchange. These are similar to the ones we've been discussing already with the, the, the repulsive force and the attractive force. Um, but they also receive contribution from these quartic terms. And you can calculate what they are. They're given as so. Here I've replaced the mass of the particle with this delta, which is the uh, dimension uh, of the uh, it's, it's just related to the mass for now, but we'll see, we'll see precisely what that means in, in a second. And so the positive binding conjecture demands for this theory that, that this total binding energy, which is the sum of these three things, should be positive. So it's different to the weak gravity conjecture in, in the sense that the old formation would be something like the photon one should be bigger than the, uh, the photon plus the graviton should be bigger than zero. Okay, so this is a positive repulsive negative attractive and photon should be stronger than gravity. So this whole thing should be positive. But now we are saying, no, the, this whole thing here should be positive, including the quartic interactions. So it, it's a different statement to the usual weak gravity conjecture, but we propose that this is the correct formulation in ADS space. Um, and what one simple way to, to see this is that if you had BPS states, which usually saturate the conjectures, then BPS states exactly saturate this binding energy positivity. Uh, not that the photon is equal to the graviton mass, but that the full thing is, is, is zero. So are there any questions about the weak gravity conjecture in ADS space or what we call the positive binding energy conjecture? Um, okay, so, so now since this is, um, th this is an ADS space, then there should be some CFT dual statement to it. So this is what we propose, that the binding energy must be positive. Um, and you can ask, what is the dual CFT statement? Well, um, the uh, dual CFT, um, oh, was there a question? Sorry. Uh, I think there's a question typed out. Uh, so uh, question is because of quartic term, 
I think the question is about with, uh, why is aquatic term necessary or is it something that uh, you can do? Is it important to, to, to put it in? Yeah, if, it, if it's there, then it, if it's, I mean, if it's not there, if it's zero, then you just return back to the other statement. You just, just get a contribution from these two, but generically it's there. Um, uh, generically from the CFT uh, arguments, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But not really CFT, but just from a theory, yeah. like if you have a super symmetric theory, for example, then, then you, can, you can calculate this A and B coefficients and there's something of order one. Was that the question? Why why is the quadric term there? Or yeah, what is yeah, it? Uh, okay. I think, uh, I think that's what, what is the question? Yeah, so it doesn't have to be there. Um, and then you would just get the same thing. Uh, I mean, the, the statement is just take you take your theory and whatever theory you choose. And the claim is that in that theory, one consistency condition is that you should have a, a particle with a positive binding. You calculate the binding energy and it should be positive. If your theory doesn't have quadric terms, then fine, you just get these contributions here. So it doesn't have to be quartic terms. But if it does have quartic terms, then you see that it's different to the original weak gravity conjecture because they do contribute. Yeah, I'm just saying that uh, uh, from the point of view of CFT, if you have this uh, non trivial, the quartic terms are necessary for, to give you this multi trace uh, stuff, right? That the, uh, uh, some, uh, some non trivial uh, cheap. Uh, so I think there was a discussion by Paul Tinsky and all that, uh, this. Quantum terms and have some uh, lead to some kind of new uh, three point functions at the boundary. Um, yes, it could do, but I, I don't think this, I don't know if they're necessarily to be there. No, yeah, they necessarily should not be there. Yeah. Like if, I don't know, there. but if they are there, then you get something new. That's all. I mean, mm. this is just to illustrate that this positive binding statement is different to the. We grab yes. it and usually say this is all we wanted to, to show. So then you can ask what is the dual conformal field theory statement to this positive binding? And there is a nice, uh, it has a very nice and neat dual CFT, which is that the, uh, the anomalous dimension of the operator dual to the field should be positive um, of, the, of, of, the, of the operator phi squared. So maybe I should explain this a bit better. So in the ADS, there was some field phi which was charged under U1 gauge symmetry. In the dual CFT, there'll be some operator, which I'll also call phi. Um, and that operator will be charged under U1 global symmetry, which is the dual to the U1 gauge symmetry. Um, and you have, uh, you can look at an operator phi squared, which you can define to be the leading operator in the OPE of phi times phi. And you look at the dimension of that operator and you take away twice the dimension of the operator phi, this is what I would call the anomalous dimension of phi squared. And this should be positive. It should be bigger than zero. That's the CFT dual statement for that theory that we had. And the reason is that um, uh, the, the dimension of the operator is the energy of the state. Um, and the phi squared is like the two particle state. So that's the particle and its copy. And phi is like the one particle. So if you had a particle in its copy, and if they attracted, then the two particle state would have an energy which is less than twice the one particle state. And if they repelled, the two particle energy state would have an energy which, which is bigger than the twice the one particle state. And so since we want them to repel, to have a positive binding energy, that means we want this to be positive. So here phi is a single trace. Um, yeah, so in this case, uh, phi is single trace operator. In this case, because phi would be just a fundamental field, um, and phi squared would, would typically be double trace if you have a large n. But we will formulate it more generally without necessarily talking about single multi traces or anything like that. Um, but if you had a large n theory, then phi would be yeah the single trace, and, and phi squared should be naturally the multi trace double trace. <laughs> Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to rewrite this in terms of the charge of the operators. So since phi has charge Q under the gauge U1 in the ADS, this operator phi has charge Q under the global U1, and phi squared has charge 2Q. And so this would, the conjecture implies that if you look at the operator of charge 2Q, 
the dimension of the operator charge Q must be bigger than twice the dimension of the operator charge Q. That's the, the formulation. And this is essentially um, what we will propose um, um, should be true. So this is naturally the CFT dual to the what we call the positive binding conjecture in ADS. Um, but now we do, we make what's called a while, what we call the while leap, if you like. And we say that this statement, this positivity statement here, um, <coughs> um, it doesn't refer to any weakly curved gravitational dual. And so it can be, it can be formulated and tested for any CFT. And we propose that it's true for, in fact, any CFT, not just those that have some weakly curved gravitational dual. So, you could say that every CFT defines a quantum theory of gravity. Only some of them define what you would call Einstein gravity duals, so weakly curved uh, gravitational duals. Um, other ones define other kind of quantum theories of gravity, like higher spin gravity and things like that. Um, and uh, we propose that since this conjecture is formulated in this general way, it can we hold for any CFT that it holds for any CFT? This is this wild leap. And as you say, uh, one test of this, sorry? Is there any assumption of unitarity here? Are you not we insist on a unitary CFT. Yeah, sorry. I, yeah, okay. I, I'll, I'll say that in a second. It should be unitary CFT. Yeah. Um, and, and one test is that this formulation has no problem uh, handling gravity duals, which let's say have an infinite number of, of, of massless high spin fields, which is what we expect to be the type of kind of strongly curved gravitational duals to be like. Um, so this is the wild leap, and we, we, we propose that this is true. Um, but the thing is, we can now, we will then go and test it and see if it's really the case. Um, so what we propose is the following conjecture. Um, consider any uh, unitary CFT, and this is the abelian convex arch conjecture, with a U1 global symmetry, uh, denote by delta Q the dimension of the lowest dimension operator of charge Q, um, then uh, this must satisfy a convex-like constraint. So the dimension of n of charge plate of charge n1 q0 plus n2 q0 is bigger than n1 q0 plus n2 q0 for any positive integers n1 and 2 for some q0 of order 1. So q0 is like the charge of the particle that we had before and n1 and n2 just means that you could take instead of just one particle instead of just one particle on and, and, and its copy which would just be n1 equals n2 equals 1 so then you would have 2q here and 2 of Delta Q, that's the example we had before, you may take any number of particles on either side and it should not form a bound state. Um, so this is what we call the abelian convex charge conjecture. And we propose that this holds for every CFT, um, just because we're motivated by weakly curved CFTs, but um, we propose it holds for any CFT, unitary CFT. Um, are there any questions? No. Um, okay, so what is this Q0? Well, from the kind of bound state intuition, we expect it to be the charge of the operator with the smallest dimension to charge ratio in the theory. That's the ones that make these stable bound states. And it's clear that if we define it that way, the conjecture will automatically follow. So in other words, um, if, if, if Q0 is the charge such that delta Q0 over Q0 is the smallest one in the theory, then it's also going to be smaller than delta of NQ0 of NQ0, which then uh, roughly gives back the, the conjecture. Just multiplying this out. Um, so the really non-trivial statement is that Q0 should be of order one. So this is really capturing the, the, the positive binding energy because you know if you had a particle which was self-attractive, then you you know the charge one state would have uh, the charge two state would have uh, a smaller mass to charge ratio than the charge one state. And the charge three state would have yet smaller ones because each time you add states they have some binding energy which reduces the energy of the theory, but um, keeps the charge the same. So uh, uh, it reduces the mass to charge ratio. So this way you would form the, the, the operators with smallest mass to charge ratio would be those dimension to charge ratio would be those with very, very large charge because you could just keep throwing states in. Uh, the positive, if, you, if you had a, a theory which satisfies the positive binding conjecture, you cannot do that. So then you could have some operator of order one, which has the smallest dimension to charge ratio of the theory. And the opposite is not quite true, though. So um, convexity is a stronger statement than binding energy, uh, basically because it includes uh, operators that are dual to one part, possibly to one particle states. But it's a subtlety that's not important to go into here. 
So before starting to test the conjecture, we can formulate it more generally, uh, even for non-abelian symmetries. So the statement is this, consider any CFT with a continuous global symmetry group G, consider simple factor G0 and G, and donate by del denote by delta R the dimension of the lowest dimension operator in some presentation R of G. There's always some representation R0, which is non-trivial in G0 and has weights of order one, such as the dimensions of the operator, which transforms in the representation which is the symmetric product, the Q symmetric product of R0 um, satisfies a convex like constraint. So this is very naturally related to the previous one. It's just that instead of Q0, we now have R0 because we have a non-abelian symmetry. So some charge, some representation of it. And instead of N times Q0, we have the symmetric product of this representation, uh, the N symmetric product of the representation. So that's the, the natural non-abelian generalization of the conjecture. So are there any questions and, uh, before we go on to test if this could be true in, in CFTs? Um, yeah, well, why do you write, need G0 to be a simple factor? Um, we, well, I'd, if you have multiple factors, then, um, well, it, so R, R0 is non-trivial in G0, but it could also be non-trivial in other parts of G. Um, so it's not saying that the representation is only charged under G zero, but, uh, you need to have some, some symmetry in your theory. So you look at a simple factor. I mean, I think that's a natural statement. Uh, yeah. Are there any other questions or. Yeah, but suppose if, it, if your group group doesn't have a simple factor, then you cannot. Well, then it's the whole, you could just take the whole group itself. Then you take the whole we just group mean that it, yeah, we just yeah. mean that it, if it factorizes, you should look at each factor. You should, you should have this true for each factor separately. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so that's the conjecture. We can go and test it. So let's try to think a bit more. The thing generally, first of all, could it be true? Could you have this, this convexity in the spectrum? So at large charge, for generic CFTs, the spectrum is indeed convex. This is something that people have, have worked out very nicely over the last few years, that if you have a generic CFT and you look at dimension of operators of very large charge, then it behaves this way. And that is convex because um, uh, roughly speaking to test the conjecture, you, you can you look at the, the, at the, the, the coefficient in front of the, 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 non, the first nonlinear uh, piece in charge. So, because you have to take the second derivative and ask for this to be positive, that's, that's very similar to this convexity statement. Uh, a convex function has a positive second derivative. So, um, uh, because this power is bigger than one and its coefficient is positive, this will be convex. Um, if you had, uh, so this is nice. So, for generic CFT at large charge, the spectrum is convex and the conjecture will be true. Um, of course, the statement, the conjecture is much stronger than this, though, because it says that it's not just true at large charge, it's true at charge of order one. So that's the really non-trivial statement. Um, if you look at BPS states in supersymmetric theories, um, or if you look at a free scalar theories, then the, the dimension of the charge is just proportional to the charge. It just goes like uh, linearly related to the charge. And this means that it's marginally convex. So it's just a straight line. That's, that's a marginally convex function. That means that the inequality would be exactly saturated. So you would have delta n q zero is exactly equal to n delta q zero. Um, okay, this is yeah. Um, if you look at a free fermionic theory, so a theory of free fermions, then the spectrum is not even marginally convex. At least if we take q zero equal to the number of components of the fermion, and that's because of the Pauli's explicit principle, which means that if you if you had some fermionic theory and you try to to build a large charge operator then you would try to insert more powers of the fermion in, but you cannot insert uh, too many because um, you have a Grassmannian variable, so you can only have one power of it in there, otherwise you get zero. So this is part of the exclusion principle, essentially. And so if you want to create high charge operators in, in fermionic theories, you have to insert derivatives into the theory, into the operator. So the operator has to have some derivatives in it. If you have a derivatives in it, then they increase the dimension of the operator, but not the charge. So that means that the spectrum becomes uh, very non-convex. So for example, this is the spectrum for free fermions of three dimensions. 
the dimension of charge one and two are, are marginally convex. That's because there's two components in a fermion. But then already when you go to three, you see that it's no longer marginally convex. So for example, the dimension of charge two plus the dimension of charge three is not even marginal compared to the dimension of charge five. So that means that the spectrum is, is convex. Uh, conjecture is true, um, uh, uh, not even marginally for free fermionic theory. And that means if you take any small perturb perturbation of a free fermionic theory, so that means you take any perturbative theory, um, the, it will maintain convexity because it cannot change an order one convexity. It's a small parameter, small perturbation about the free theory. So that's true. So then any, any, any kind of perturbative theory where there's any perturbation parameter could also be large N or anything like that, which has um, uh, fermionic theory will satisfy the conjecture. So that's, that's nice. The only way out is if you have a very large number of fermions. So the only parameter which could compete, which could make this uh, a convexity uh, become parametric, Q0 parametrically large, so not of order one, is the number of fermions in the theory. So um, because then you don't have to put derivatives into the operators. You can just put lots and lots of these fermions because there's many, many of them. Um, you can put lots of them in and, and still um, have a, a non-vanishing operator. So that's nice. So is, if you have any fermionic theory with a, a, a few number of fermions, then the conjecture will be satisfied um, for sure. Um, if it is not a perturbative theory, if it's a strongly coupled theory, then the conjecture will again be satisfied because of this large charge behavior, which kicks in when the charge is bigger than any uh, small perturbative, any uh, big parameter in your theory. Since the theory is strong but has no big parameters, then the large charge kicks in at the order one, which means the theory is convex. So the only theories that are not could, could possibly not be convex are those with the large number of fermions. Uh, in two dimensions, there's a possible counterexample which can make Q zero parametrically large, and so we restrict the CFTs in in three or bigger dimensions. And this matches nicely the fact that if you look at a two D CFT, it would be dual to three D gravity, and three D gravity is non-propagating. And also gauge fields can be massive in the bulk, so it behaves completely differently to all the kind of intuitive arguments I just told you. So it's very natural to restrict the conjecture to D bigger than or equal to three in the CFT. So this is what we do. Um, and now we can look at specific theories. So those are general statements. What about specific theories where well, we could test it? And I'll go through those um, quickly in the last five minutes or so. So this is the um, what we want to test, we test uh, and, and we look at fields in specific theories. We'll look at weakly coupled CFTs, mostly and sometimes strongly coupled, but with some expansion. And what we do is we look at the dimension of, of something like phi to the n1 plus n2 minus the dimension of phi to the n1 plus dimension phi to n2. This is what we want to be convex. So this must be positive. So this is what we want to test in your theories. And the first, the simplest kind of theory you can consider is the Wilson Fisher U1 theory in four minus epsilon dimension. And that's a CFT. Um, is that not a vigorous stress because it's not really a unitary CFT, but it's non unitary in, in a slightly different way. So one may still test it in this theory. So this is the theory. It's just a, a, a scalar field with quartic interactions. It has a U1 global symmetry. Um, there's a fixed point at lambda equals epsilon over five. One can calculate this convexity parameter, the dimension of the operator phi to the n, and then calculate this convexity, and you find that it's positive, so it satisfies the conjecture. So it is indeed convex, and one can also show that it remains convex for any value of epsilon times n. So it remains value for any n. It's convex for any n, so this passes the conjecture. So this is positive, and therefore it's convex. One can look at the Owen quartic model in four minus epsilon dimensions, and again, you find that this coefficient is positive, so the spectrum is convex. Um, you can look at the U1 and ON sextic models in three minus epsilon dimensions. Um, again, one finds that the spectrum is convex, so it passes all those tests. Um, so another thing you can do is instead of looking at some epsilon expansion, you can look at large N expansion of a CFT and calculate convexity there. You need to calculate the enormous dimensions there. So um, you can look at the ON quartic model in three dimensions and do a large N expansion. And then you find that indeed, in, indeed the coefficient of the quartic term is positive. And so the theory, the spectrum is convex and satisfies the conjecture. You can also look at the ON quartic model in five dimensions or the ON cubic model in six minus epsilon dimensions. And there the, the coefficient is negative in front of the quartic terms. And that means the spectrum is not convex. So it, it violates the conjecture. But it's also true that precisely in those 
in those theories, those theories are non-unitary. So they're non-unitary theories. So that's okay because we restrict unitary theories. So the conjecture passes all those tests. You could do more tests like UM times UN quartic model and format of dimensions. And again, that's convex. Um, let's look at another qualitatively different thing. We can just look at gauge theories, like standard four-dimensional gauge theories. Um, we can look at things like bank zacks fixed point of SUNC gauge theory with NF masses fermions and NS masses scalars. And the fixed point, if you have scalars, you need the fixed point to coincide also with the, the scalar quartic terms, um, fixed points, which have these, 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 these uh, uh, quartic terms in the theory. And these are the couplings of them, H and F tilde. This theory has an SUNS global symmetry to do with the scalars. And you can look at operators charged under this global symmetry, which are like these mesons. Uh, this is phi star, not phi dagger, because that would be, phi dagger would be a, a flavor singlet. We want a, a flavored charged object. So you want two different flavors here on these scalars. And then you get something in the adjoint of the SUNS global symmetry, and you take the nth power of that. Um, so you can calculate the convexity for this spectrum of states, and you, you calculate the dimension of the, of the two meson operator, take away twice the dimension of the one meson operator, and um, you find that this is, goes like some positive number times H plus F, and that is positive, um, because H plus F must be positive so that um, uh, you don't have runaway behavior in this potential, and therefore the spectrum is convex. So that also passes that test. Another test you can do is look at three-dimensional gauge theories, um, which become uh, flow to a fixed point in infrared. Um, and uh, with NF fermions, you can calculate um, the dimension. So th those theories have the U1 topological global symmetry, and the operators charged under it are monopole operators. And at large NF you, NF, you can calculate the dimension of these operators, and uh, they go like this. Um, uh, 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 and, and this is the, what the calculation shows, and you can see that this is convex. So twice times one is less than two, one plus two is less than three, and so on. So indeed, in these theories, again, you find convexity. So this, this satisfies the conjecture. Um, you can do similar computations for um, uh, um, scalar theories with scalars instead of fermions in three dimensions. With and without quartic terms, these are CPN model and tricritical models, they're called. And again, the spectrum is convex. You can do it with fermions and cross nova types couplings. Again, you find the spectrum is convex. You can add Chern Simons terms to these theories and uh, at level K. And you can show that adding Chern Simons interactions just make the spectrum more convex. So, in all the theories that we could look at, we always found a convex spectrum. That's not important. Um, and um, you can also look at strongly coupled theories like the O2 model in three dimensions. And again, you find that the spectrum is convex. So using various different kinds of methods. And that's interesting because the O2 model in three dimensions also describes the, the superfluid transition of liquid helium. And, and, and uh, some operators can even be measured experimentally. So it's interesting because one can then, one has convexity in a theory that you can even realize in the lab. So, uh, since convexity is related to the weak gravity conjecture, and that's what we try to argue, um, it's quite an interesting way to kind of connect weak gravity conjecture to something that you can actually make an experiment. So to summarize, um, propose that the natural formulation of the weak gravity conjecture is in terms of the binding energy of a particle. Uh, this leads to a CFT dual statement, which is that the spectrum of charged operators should be convex. Um, seems to hold in all the examples we tested so far. Uh, at least if we demand unitarity and vacuum stability, but one needs to keep testing it since it's, it's just a conjecture. We, we don't know if it's true or not, but um, it seems to be true so far. Um, there's an opportunity for proof because uh, CFT is a well-defined framework. It's much uh, more strictly defined than quantum gravity. So uh, perhaps there's a way to prove that a spectrum of CFT must be convex in this way. And this would also prove the weak gravity conjecture or the positive binding conjecture in ADS. And I said there was some possible connection to experiments uh, uh, by looking at CFTs, which describe some experiment systems you can make in experiments. So that's the end of the talk. Um, thank you. Yeah. Thanks a lot uh, for this beautiful talk. Uh, question time.
So I have actually two questions. So first question is uh, about, uh, we also know that uh, uh, like ADS, the, the, ADS can be dual to some RG flows uh, and you can have domain walls and stuff like that. And there's in that case, some running of comma. Uh, so do you have some, uh, some statement about this uh, that it should remain positive for along the RG flows? Or yeah, that's a good question. I do not know. Yeah, many people ask me this. I do not know what happens when you, when you move away from CFT. Uh, so I don't have any, we don't, we only make statements about CFTs. So that, that would be pure, pure ADS. Uh, yeah. Okay. I, I do not know what happens when there's, when you, you don't have a CFT. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so you cannot make a very rigorous statement in that case. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, very, it's difficult to even formulate it properly because you need, you need to know the anomalous dimensions of operators and so on. So Yeah, because it's operator mixing and uh, yeah. it's not the same operator anymore. Uh, so, yeah. uh, so the other related question is, uh, you also can have non-local operators, right? Like Wilson loops and... Uh, which can have will be charged under a global symmetry. So do you um, have something to say about those? Well, they would be charged not under, they would be charged under sort of higher form symmetries. So yeah, I don't know what the answer is. That's, a, that's a very, also an interesting question. I do not know what the, the natural statement is there. Yeah. No, just uh, the actually, Wilson loop, uh, for example, if you have, a, if you have some, some kind of a field uh, in the supersymmetric Wilson loop that also has a global charge. No, I'm sorry, I that's what I'm saying is not correct. Yeah. There, right? You should have only some higher, higher form symmetries, this kind of surface yeah. operators of nature. Yeah, I do not know what the statement is there, but it's it's actually something we're thinking about a little bit. But I do not, I do not know. I don't have anything concrete to. Yeah. <laughs> because the higher form symmetries also can mediate long range forces, right? And, uh, yeah, I do not know. I mean, yeah, it's, like it's related to the natural high dimensional versions of the weak gravity conjecture. So, yeah. Right. Okay, so, uh, so uh, then, uh, so as far as the proof is concerned, uh, uh, so, so when you started the first, the first thing that you said about absence of global symmetry. So there is a harlow Okuri kind of proof which uh, looks into various axioms and uh, of and, and, and try to formalize it. Uh, that is from the, uh, so, so you think that there could be a similar development that one can uh, do a very formal proof of this in this context. I think it would be hard to prove the weak gravity conjecture on the gravity side. The easier to prove the convexity on the CFT side, I think. So, ah, I see. Yeah, so it's hard. An extension for the yeah. an extension of the harlow gurry kind of argument on the gravity side is harder. I think so. I think it's hard to prove things on in quantum gravity. Prove anything in quantum gravity is hard. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's some. Um, uh, but even in the context of ADS, it is it's very hard to kind of uh, see some. some yeah, some I do not know. I do not know what's easier. Yeah. Or not. yeah, I think I think it's less. It's more likely to come from the CFT side. Yeah, that, that's my guess. Yeah. Okay. So uh, thanks for again for this nice talk, and uh, yeah, you will upload you. the video on YouTube. <laughs> Let me Great. stop recording. Thanks for the.